You know that feeling you get when you sense a team's winning streak is about to end? Or when you know the pundits are getting it all wrong? That feeling? That's me. I'm your hunch. I was there back in Istanbul when you just knew the comeback was on. I'm the guy that tells you when the odds don't look so odd. I'm your hunch. It's time to start listening. Heed your hunch with Betway. Download the app to find out more about Betway's Bet Club. Full terms apply. 18 plus, dunlouis.net. Bet the responsible way. Summer is here, and Twite Summer Art Auction is now online. Enjoy wonderful works by Paul Henry, Cecil Maguire, Dan O'Neill, William Scott, Louis Lebrocki, Andy Warhol, Banksy, and many others. Viewing anytime at whites.ie or at our galleries by appointment. Bidding ends Monday, 6th of July at whites.ie. At Guaranteed Irish, we believe enterprise is at the heart of thriving communities. Did you know Gem Pack Foods have been making baking a piece of cake for the people of Ireland since 1967? Based in Damastown, County Dublin, they've been providing Ireland with gem baking ingredients that are good enough for granny for over 50 years. Guaranteed Irish welcomes companies that are altogether better choices for our communities. So look out for it. GuaranteedIrish.ie. Altogether better. I wish I was 50 years younger and I'd kick your ass. Well, fans can be the harshest critics, you know. And they often are. A wife is often the harshest critic <laughs> of her husband. <laughs> I thought I was invincible. That's what you're, you're trained to believe as a sports person. There was four million people in Ireland who knew much more about managing <laughs> football teams than I did. When it comes to music, I can spoof for the best. Your sporting career is the best time you'll have and, you know, you have to hang on to it for as long as your life because everything else is pretty crappy. And this is not lies. Stephen Rochford has never spoken to Jimmy McGinnis in his life. OK, so one of the big stories over the past week was the news that Jack McCaffrey has stepped away from the Dublin panel for the coming season. It's not going to be his first break from the game and he's certainly not the first Irish athlete to take a break from sport either. And today's Saturday panel features three Irish sports people who for various reasons and at various times decided to take some time out during their sporting careers. So we've got Republic of Ireland footballer Ani O'Gorman, Zebra forward Ian Nagel and boxer Eric Donovan with us. Folks, you're all very welcome. Anya, we might uh, kick things off with you. Uh, this, I'd imagine, was a fairly unique position to be in, coming out of international retirement this year, and then all of a sudden you've got a second hiatus, basically, with the shutdown of sports in around February or March. Yeah, yeah, obviously at the time it wasn't great, but um, obviously yeah, I came out of retirement, came back for the, the Greece and Montenegro game, and we flew back from Montenegro on the Thursday and landed in Dublin Airport with the news of the schools closing down because of, obviously... The, the coronavirus so yeah then we've obviously been on shoot down we're only back now training with club two or three weeks so we've had uh, several fixtures cancelled and they're all rescheduled now for September and October December this year so fingers crossed they go ahead Does it feel like a hiatus what's happened over the last three months does it feel like you've had a step back from sport I, I think there's kind of been a, a cloud over everything of uncertainty especially like even for the first month you probably thought you could have been back playing next month so perhaps it didn't feel like a full break but uh, I'm not sure what your experience was yeah, I think so. I think you're always always thinking like it's kind of that unknown feeling mm. that uh, is probably the toughest to deal with. Um, you don't know when you're going to be back training or playing or if there will be football this year or not. But luckily now the, the season is going to kick off um, the 7th, the 9th of August, sorry, this year. And then we'll be into, uh, into fingers crossed, we'll be into international football in September. So yeah, but look, I think everyone was in the same boat. I think it'd be nearly worse if like it's an, it's nearly worse when you're injured and you can't play and everyone else is playing. So, um, everyone was on a level playing field from that regard. But obviously in Germany they they got back playing a little bit bit quicker than we did as well. And they're our next uh, opponent in September. So, um, we all just need to get get back playing as soon as possible. Let's talk about your actual time away for a little bit. Your, your time away from the Republic of Ireland setup, at least. Did you think at any point when you initially retired that you would come back? That it was just a break from international football. Um, not at the time, no. Um, under the current management and stuff like that, no. I was, I was really happy with my decision to step away and let the younger players come through. Um, I, I just it, the timing was right for me after all the commitment I'd given. I've been playing in the senior team since I was sixteen, so um, step back. But look, the opportunity came back to to go back in new management and stuff in as well, and it was like a fresh start. So, um, when the opportunity came round, I I grabbed it with with two hands and 
and was delighted to get back play. How did you feel when you came back? Did, it, did you feel like a, a refreshed footballer coming back into the Ireland fold? Obviously, it was a very specific set of circumstances that forced you out in the first place. Yeah, like, obviously, yeah, I think you get back in, you're obviously, um, it's a new setup, a new environment, um, and it's fresh, but you still feel like you've never really left, like, um, a lot of the players that I played were are still there, so I think I only took a, a day or two to settle back in, and it was, it was just like it was before. Ian, you took a, a total break from sport. Uh, for people who don't know, you played with Munster for, you really started your professional career at Munster and played for four years, wasn't it? And then what happened? Uh, yeah, so I had been with Munster, I suppose, from uh, the academy set up into a senior contract. But uh, for the last few years, I struggled with a few injuries um, and uh, I probably fell out of love a small bit with rugby uh, at the time. Um, and uh, I was looking at the different opportunities and, and one of them was to go back studying. I'd never really committed myself to studying before and um, uh, the opportunity kind of uh, presented itself to maybe look into doing an MBA. Um, and the more I looked into that, the more excited I got by doing that. And um, I ended up kind of taking a two year break the first year where I just traveled with uh, friends just uh, around South America. And uh, that was brilliant in itself, just because I'd never really had an opportunity to do that before from, I suppose, about 16 onwards. Every uh, summer would have been committed to pre-seasons and um, rugby would have would have kind of occupied my mind. Um, you know, uh, would have been uh, fairly uh, committed to, to rugby and every decision I made would have been prioritizing rugby. So it was a great break just to get away for a year or two and do something completely different um, thankfully it worked out the, the MBA was in Cambridge University right yeah yeah one year just for one year Is that not a, a path well worn where a rugby player ends up going to, to Cambridge afterwards was this something that you'd considered early in life and you perhaps thought that the education thing was something you might never get around to um, to be honest I, it's not really something I'd, I'd consider too much um, so I kind of got to a funny crossroads, really. Um, I had gone on loan from Munster to Newcastle. And uh, the first week that I was there, I got a bad injury on my ankle. And that ruled me out for the rest of the season. And at that stage, then I kind of made the decision, look, I'm going to do something else. And funny enough, the crossroads I was at was to either go into the military or um, to go into business school. Um, so I kind of spent the next four or five months meeting as many people as I could from um, both sides of things and just talking about their experiences and their, their, um, uh, you know, what their advice would be. Um, and the more I looked down the military side of things, uh, I probably came to the conclusion I was a bit too old. Um, I, uh, went to the barracks in Cork and spoke to a colonel there and, um, I actually went to, uh, over to the UK, uh, to a base for the Marines and just spoke to as many people as I could and just, um, realised I was probably a bit too old to get started down that route. But what age were you? Um, I was 24, right. 24, 25, yeah. Um, and then uh, I looked more into the business school and uh, the people I spoke with really kind of sold it to me. Um, as much for that I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do after rugby and the, the MBA is a good transition to, to kind of get a, a taste of, of different industries and that type of thing. So. The more I looked into that, then I um, got more excited about it. And in terms of the application, I actually thought it was a long shot. Really, you know, um, the the rugby side of things is a is a is a good one to have in terms of your work experience. But then the academic side of things, I um, thought would have been a stretch for me. So um, when I when I got the 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 offer, I was delighted and, and kind of took it with both hands. Why did you fall out of love with the game? Um. Yeah, good question. I suppose. I suppose I I, I, I really like rugby, uh, uh, but I probably, you know, didn't love it enough or don't love it enough for for it to consume my entire life. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, I kind of have different interests in, in different things, and up to that point, I really had just made rugby um, my everything in terms of uh, you know life decisions I'd made, or even in university instead of. Having a normal university experience, I'd be up early and I'd be training, and I wouldn't be going out because I'd be trying to be disciplined and, and uh, 
and seeing what other friends were doing, whether it was you know traveling or going on J1s or or starting their own little businesses or whatever, I, I probably envied them them slightly. Um, and uh, I would have been very happy to continue playing rugby, but but at the same time I was just as excited to do something else maybe. Um, and and back playing rugby now, I'm, I'm delighted to be playing rugby, but it's it's nice to know that whenever I do finish playing rugby, there are other things out there that I'll be just ex as excited to do, hopefully. Absolutely. Eric, did you ever consider joining the military? Oh, we just uh, appear to have lost your audio there, Eric. We'll get that sorted uh, in just a moment. Uh, we might go back to you for a second, Donnie, because it's very interesting what Ian is saying about having fallen out of love with the game. Uh, did that ever happen to you at any point where you actually fell out of love with the sport of football or was it a very specific situational thing with the Republic of Ireland? No, I don't think I'd say I, I did fall out of love with, with football at all. Um, obviously, I was when I stepped back from the international team, I was still playing with my club team in Piedmont. Um, and I think when I did step back, I, I was really, really enjoying my football and um, and and really enjoy the club at Piedmont. So now I think I would be a bit lost if if I wasn't playing football. But obviously I'm lucky as well, like that I have a bit more, a bit of balance in my life and um, and personal training, fitness structure, and um, so I have other things going on in life as well. And just wanted to step back and just focus on things like that. Like like um he said as well that you just miss out on so many things growing up and um, throughout like your college life and um life choices you make and even with like things like your six year holiday when your friends are on your six year holiday and you're just um committing yourself to football and it's family things as well you miss out on as well. So um I think that was part of the reason why I stepped back and um was just enjoying my club football and was able to do all them things and refresh now going back into the setup. It's interesting that you mentioned the interests outside of sport there, Anya, and immediately what I would think if, if you compare your story with Ian's is that being a personal trainer outside of sport is very similar to sport itself. It's quite a sports-based job, I guess. Did you ever feel that it was too much or that you were focusing too much on sport or was it actually great to be pursuing both walks of life with all the energy that you have? Yeah, I think so. Like, I think that that's what, what I enjoy doing and I have a passion for as well. So, um that's obviously uh, the direction that that I was. If I didn't play football, I probably mm -hmm. probably still pursue. And obviously, I did my coaching badges as well. My way for B, and um, just shortly after, I, I took a step back from the international team as well, which was great to have. And and hopefully that will lead to some sort of path after my playing career is over as well in coaching. So, and um, who knows what happens? But uh, during the COVID, I did start a, an online course, <laughs> business management and leadership as well. So that's a little bit different than a. Uh, personal training so that's a, it's a little bit of a different challenge for me that that I'm relishing to. Well we seem to have got uh, Eric's line up and running there. Uh, Eric Donovan you're welcome back. Uh, tell us your story for people who don't know. Talk to us about your break from boxing. Yeah um, sorry about that guys. Uh, <laughs> Not at all. No, uh, the um, funny you asked that, the, the question about the military. Ian was speaking there I was actually considering joining the military oh, uh, nice. many times. You know, as a Kildare man and the Curra being so close and uh, I had some friends and former boxers that uh, represented their club, went into the, you know, went down that route as well. And um, I just kept putting it off and then chasing the Olympics and people were, I was getting mixed messages. Some people were saying the army will be brilliant and it'll give you loads of time off. And then I was hearing from other boxers who were saying, no, they have to go on duty and they're not getting time off. And getting mixed messages all the time. And then I just kept plowing forward and chasing the Olympic dream. And then in 2013, I realized I was 27 years old. I had just returned from an eight-month stint in Kazakhstan. And um, I gave up on my education. I gave up on work, work you know, uh, taking the plunge into the into the work, work life or the workforce. And so I didn't really have much work experience. And Give up for 10 years I've been supported from the age of 17 to 27 I was supported by uh, Sport Ireland and funded by them and now suddenly I wasn't number one in Ireland anymore and now I wasn't supported by uh, I wasn't funded I wasn't on a grant anymore and I had two young boys and I was standing in, in the queue signing on the dole and I was like this is not how it was meant to be uh, I didn't this is not how I envisaged life my life to be you know and um very felt very anxious felt very lonely at that time and very confused as well because i 
had given so much to my to my boxing career and in some ways as as Ian said there about you know being consumed by it like I was consumed by boxing boxing became my whole identity dangerously so that I didn't realize anything I didn't know I kind of lost myself you know and then I realized I was boxing for the wrong reasons I was boxing for my coach boxing for my family boxing for trying to just make people happy around me so I kind of I walked away from it then in 2013 and I went I knew I had to do something for my future to, to, to have a bit more of a security in my future and I went back into education then and I studied counseling and psychotherapy and went back as a mature student, did a two two year full time course and diploma, got a got a diploma in two thousand and fifteen and I was about to go for my degree in two thousand and sixteen when when I when I started to kind of get the urge again to box, to go back boxing. And this time it was for all the right reasons. It was for all the kind of more like a redemption story, all the near misses, all the setbacks, all the shortcomings I had in my life. I kind of over the sabbatical, I kind of got my life back in gear, back together and got my, uh, kind of found myself again. And I had a new sense of, uh, a kind of a new maturity, a new strength, a new focus. And even the breakaway gave me a chance to learn about boxing from a different, from a different perspective, even, even from a coaching perspective, I was doing a little bit of coaching and I was keeping fit, but I wasn't competing. And then, Sure enough, the conclusion I came to was I can always go back and do my degree, but I can't always go back and box. And I just felt like I'd one more round, one more fight in me, I had something left to achieve, and I didn't want to finish up um, and have any any regrets. And so I turned pro in 2016, and now I'm, you know, I'm I'm, I'm the undefeated Irish professional featherweight champion, and I'm on the verge of a world ra- world ranking title fight, and I'm going to make my Sky Sports debut on the 14th of August. And Eddie Hearn's fight card, uh, fight camp in his backyard. So, um, how the times have changed, eh? Yeah, not bad. But it's some story. Like if you had to pick one strand or, or one theme that came from your hiatus, the thing that transformed your career and transformed your mindset and allowed you to fight for the right reasons. What was that thing? What was that experience? Was there a tangible moment? Oh, there was definitely. I just I. I I had to learn a bit more about Eric and um, I had to change my life. You know, I was very distracted throughout my amateur career. Um, I, you know, I suffered badly with mental health issues and I used a lot, I had a lot of coping mechanisms to deal with that. Um, I was dealing with something very, very powerful that I had no understanding or awareness of, you know, what kind of damage I was doing to myself or to people around me. It was just, I was almost a slave to my addictions. And uh, everything was an addiction to me. I obsessed with everything, whatever I touched. And uh, um, I had to, I had to educate myself. I had to find out why I was thinking the way I was thinking, why I was feeling the way I was feeling, and acting the way I was acting. So I had to go and understand a lot about the about the mind, about myself. And you know, once I kind of got to grips with all of that, I was in a much better position to be able to make decisions. For my life, for my future, um, I mean, the outcome of a boxing match previous to my professional career would determine my whole well-being, my whole life. You know, it would, mm. it would just, it was everything. It dominated every conversation. It was just every, you know, every time I woke up to the time I went to bed, I, I actually got to the stage where I hated boxing because boxing was, boxing like was became my identity, and I didn't know who I was. I was kind of lost in the back of that, but um. You know, I remember being a young kid and boxing was so much fun from the age of probably seven up till around 15. It was so much fun and I enjoyed it. I loved it and I expressed myself so well in it. And I I could go anywhere and and get in with anybody and feel absolutely 100% free and confident and everything. But then I got distracted in my life. You know, I started going down the road of drinking and smoking and using drugs. And then I just, boxing became uncool. And then other stuff became cool and I kind of got lost. And then I was kind of juggling both and trying to navigate both, but it wasn't really working out for me. It was, it was, an, it was an awful sh- strain on my life and a, a, a huge stress. And I was like that for nearly a p- period of 10 years then. 
and uh, sometimes I'd get good periods and 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 of you know being on the straight and narrow, but then I'd always fall back into old ways and old habits. So I had to kind of change my whole life, root and branch. I'm not talking about changing your clothes or you know getting a new haircut. I had to change everything. I had to change everything, friends, social life, habits, just completely. And and I'm happy now. I'm happy in my life now. And you know, I'm, I was supposed to get married next Thursday in in, in Spain uh, to my to my fiance Laura. And uh, we are we are both good. One of us more so than the other because I've a, there's a silver lining. I'm after getting the Sky Sports fight on the 14th of August, and that wouldn't have came, that certainly wouldn't have come about if it wasn't for the wedding. So you know we're getting the best of both worlds and going to have that big fight, and then you know we we get married next day, April. So uh, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, it's a really interesting point uh, you mentioned there, Eric, about how the sport completely consumed you. You were a boxer and that was it. And I'd be interested in getting your thoughts on that one, Ian, because quite often, it's obviously the case in individual sport, but quite often in team sport as well, the levels of dedication from a young kid are through the roof entirely. Like it, perhaps from a rugby player's perspective, when it comes to the schools game in Ireland, the competitive net levels are through the roof. Winning is everything. Putting every single waking moment into the cause of winning is promoted so much in team sports. Like, do you think that's an unhealthy situation to be in, Ian? And is that something that, that you can relate to Eric's situation with regards to that? Yeah, I suppose I, I still got somewhat lucky in that when I came out of school, there was still some balance between being able to have kind of a normal academic side of things if you wanted to go to university. Mm. Um, and the, the academic structure fit around let's say your university lectures and stuff like that. And I'm not sure if the balance is still the same there now, or at least I'd say the pressure of having to perform in the academies is, is a lot higher than um, what it was when I went through it. Um, Rugby is getting more and more professional and, and, the, and the kind of age that that's starting is, is, is getting lower and lower. Um, yeah, it's tough. It's tough for, uh, for, for guys coming through now, I would say. I, I found that, that I, quickly you kind of come into a bubble um, and that, that, that rugby, and I don't know if it's the same um, for Anya and Eric, but, but your sport becomes a little bit of a bubble. And, and like Eric was saying there, you find that you're just talking about rugby, you're thinking about rugby, a lot of your friends are in rugby and it just becomes yeah. rugby, rugby, rugby. And when that's going great, it's great because your whole life is going great, but then very quickly if it's not going well or you're injured or you're worried about contracts or selection or whatever, then then almost all aspects of your life are kind of negative in that moment too. Um, but it, I suppose it just starts to, get, to consume you entirely. And this is something that I really want to get into. We just have to go to news. So if you wouldn't mind holding that thought, Ian, we'll get straight back into that after two o'clock. You are listening to Anya O'Gorman, Eric Donovan and Ian Nagel talking about stepping back from sport. We'll take a quick break. The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. Panadol presents Homegrown Heroes. When communities come together, ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Meet Fergus Lennon, a volunteer with Blood Bike Leinster. We started Blood Bike Leinster back in 2013. We transport blood and blood products and medical items between different hospitals. The active ingredients in Panadol Extra Soluble relieve five types of tough pain to help you meet pain with strength and keep doing what matters most. Panadol Extra 500 mg, 65 mg soluble effervescent tablets contains paracetamol. Always read the label leaflet. It's time to trade up to a new Peugeot at Gowan Motors Navan Road. Right now, selected Peugeots come with Peugeot Drive Time. That means Peugeot ads, flexible payment options, five-year warranty, and up to €500 Euro deposit contribution or up to €3,700 and 50 euro scrappage allowance. Available now at Gowan Motors, Navan Road. Terms and conditions apply. Screen Time with John Fardy. This week on Screen Time, I talked to acclaimed actor Chiwetel Ejiofor, star of 12 Years a Slave and Doctor Strange, about his new Netflix movie, The Old Guard. Mark Ryle puts on his jazz hands and reviews Hamilton. And musician and senator Francis Black chooses a favourite movie. Screen Time with John Farty. With Elephant and Castle. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now or tune in this evening from 6 on News Talk. Afternoons are easy with insuremyvan.ie, Ireland's low-cost van insurance specialist. Get your business back on the road with insuremyvan's best price guarantee. For super savings, visit insuremyvan.ie. 
Varsity Financial Marketing Group Limited training as in Shurmanvan.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. There's lots of barbecue favourites to love at Aldi. Specially selected seeded brioche buns, four pack, 115. Sliced medium Irish red cheddar, 200 grams, 149. 5% fat lean beef burgers, 280 grams, board beer quality short and 100% Irish, only 229. And a tipple to go with the sizzle. 1079 Project Pilsner, 330 mils, 99 cent. So much to love and such amazing value at Aldi. Aldi, every day amazing. Enjoy alcohol responsibly. It's been a long wait, but now there's light in the western sky. With travel restrictions lifted, it's time to make a break for it. And with the Connemara Lay and the Sierra, a fresh adventure is never far away. Enjoy stunning seafood, unspoiled landscapes and beaches, and all in the comfort and safety of Connemara's finest hotels, restaurants, holiday cottages and guest houses. Connemara and the islands. It's a different world. At National College of Ireland, our students are living proof that studying here can help boost your career. NCI is absolutely a welcoming place. People from all walks of life come here. And everyone is treated the same. It gives you an opportunity to step back into learning and to make a real change in your life. I think that NCI gave me a real pathway to success. Yeah, I'd recommend NCI because of its commitment to helping students progress their careers. Yes, I'm living proof that NCI is the best career move you can make. Prove to yourself what you can do with our wide range of full and part-time courses at National College of Ireland. Call 1850-221-721 or visit ncirl.ie. We know it's been tough lately. For some, the garden or the balcony is your new best friend. At myhomecare.ie, we'd like to reward your commitment to staying safe by giving you the chance to enter our fantastic competition. To enter, send us pictures of how you've made your garden gorgeous in lockdown. And in 90 words or less, tell us why you should win. What's the prize, you ask? Well, there's three, including Best Garden Project wins €1,000, Best Balcony Project €500, and Best Frontline Worker Project can also win a whopping €1,000. Terms and conditions apply. See myhomecare.ie. Caring for those you care about. The COVID-19 crisis is not over, but thanks to the solidarity of the Irish people, we are taking the first steps on a return to normal life. But this means that it is more important than ever that we all act responsibly. The virus hasn't changed. It is highly infectious. It still poses huge risks. The simple things are still the most important things. We must wash our hands regularly, observe coughing and sneezing etiquette, maintain social distancing, avoid crowds where possible, and stay away from any place that you feel might be unsafe. Please always use your personal judgment to decide whether you're in a safe environment. Wear face coverings on public transport and in shops and in places where it is hard to maintain social distancing. Please continue to work from home as much as possible. Walk and cycle if you can, and use public transport only if necessary. And business owners, please follow the guidance and keep your premises safe for your staff and customers. We must all continue to work together to make sure Ireland reopens safely for everyone. We have made great progress, and our challenge now is to avoid a resurgence. So please be sensible. Be responsible, be safe, and look out for each other and our communities. Full details of the reopening of Ireland are available at gov.ie. Thank you. Supported by the Government of Ireland. On 106 to 108 FM. On Newstalk.com. On Smart Speaker. And on the Newstalk app. This this is Newstalk. It's two o'clock. Good afternoon. The Taoiseach has accepted the Agriculture Minister's remorse over a drink driving ban. Michal Martian says he only found out about Barry Cowan's disqualification yesterday. Minister Cowan was pulled over while driving from Dublin to Offaly in 2016. Ben Finnegan has more. It's emerged Agriculture Minister Barry Cowan was caught driving over the alcohol limit four years ago. He served a three month ban from driving and had to pay a €200 Euro fine as a result. Today, the Taoiseach Michal Martin says he accepts the Agriculture Minister's remorse and says it's genuine. He continues to say, however, he is disappointed in the way he found out about it and that it's been made clear to Minister Cowan. Gardaí are questioning a man in his 20s after shots were fired at Uniform Gardaí in County Cork. Officers were shot at on the military road at around 11.40 last night after responding to an incident. The suspect fled the scene, leading to a car chase lasting almost half an hour along the M8. The car was eventually stopped at the, at the northbound toll plaza and the man fired more shots at Gardaí. He was tasered and then arrested before being taken into custody. No one was injured during the incident, which have been referred to the Garda watchdog. 
We might have to wait until the 20th of July to find out which countries people can go on holiday to without needing to quarantine when they come back. The government was due to publish a green list next week, but it's reported that's now been pushed back. Ministers are concerned that easing travel restrictions could lead to a rise in coronavirus cases here. There's been criticism that some patients are being charged up to €250 for a COVID-19 test ahead of any treatment in private hospitals. Only one of the three major health insurance companies is currently covering the charge. Stephen McMahon is with the Irish Patients Association. We have some feedback from people who are using these tests that they're as low as €20 to actually pay for them versus uh, €250. So there's huge price differential here. And finally, Gardaí are carrying out checks on pubs this weekend to ensure they're following COVID-19 guidelines. Any pub not following the guidance around time limits and meals could lose their licence in the future. Dave Fitzpatrick from the Lots pub on Dublin's Liffey Street is glad the rules are being enforced. There's probably one or two places, I haven't heard of one or two places probably floating the law, but that only makes it worse for the rest of us. But we're, we're continuing to operate the practice of 105 minutes and in for a main meal. It's two minutes past two. News talk weather. Thanks to the AA. For our lowest car insurance price guaranteed, go online to the AA.ie. Mostly cloudy today with scattered outbreaks of rain and drizzle, highest temperatures 16 to 20 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Saturday panel on Off the Ball. You're very welcome back. We are joined by Oni O'Gorman, Eric Donovan and Ian Nagel to talk about stepping back from sport on our Saturday panel. You can tweet us at Off The Ball or text us using the number 53106 if you've got any questions for our panel. Uh, Ian, before the break, you were making the point that it's difficult sometimes to detach yourself from the success or the lack of success as a sports person. If you win, your happiness is dependent on that and vice versa. Is that something you've got better at as you've got older and wiser and deeper into your career? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I suppose studying in England for the year, um, it was great because the, the class I was in, we, I think there was 160 in the class and there was over 40 different nationalities. And there was gas because you'd speak to some people and they'd ask you, you know, your background and you'd say, oh, I used to play rugby. And they'd ask you, what's that? You know, and it's, uh, you kind of very quickly realized how small fry you are, you know, on the grand scheme of things. And that's, that's, great because I think coming back into rugby then you you have that perspective still with you and if ever you get consumed by the ups and downs of, of rugby in my case I found then that you can um, really kind of take a step back and, and get a much better perspective of, of how insignificant parts of it might be so um, for me yeah that made a huge difference and actually playing rugby now is much more enjoyable and, and I think that's um, it's a, a much healthier way, I think, to, to kind of play the game. And, and uh, it doesn't affect any level of professionalism or any desire, I find, but, but it just gives you a bit more, more balance in your, um, in your focus, I suppose. So how would a, a particularly tough day at Munster have gone for you when you were struggling with this, when you had failed to, to figure out exactly how your mind worked and how you managed to enjoy your rugby more? So, so I was lucky to some extent. This, 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 it never got me down as such as I just kind of got a little bit pissed off or frustrated at the, the lack of control I had in the situation. So um, if I felt that I was maybe playing well but wasn't getting opportunities or um, if I got an injury and I couldn't kind of control the speed of my rehab enough, um, those type of things would, would really frustrate me. And then... By being consumed in rugby, um, I, I probably let that kind of, you know, develop too much, I suppose. Um, and I think that, that, that now maybe I, I, I just accept those types of things a little bit more. Um, and, and as well, I probably have more of a balance outside of rugby that if, one, one, if rugby isn't going well, then I can just focus on different areas of my life and, and uh, try, you know, put more energy into making those successful. And um, I think that's so much better balance to maybe where I was at a younger stage of my career. Anya, is it fair to say that you would look at things slightly differently, even kind of looking at your hiatus? You did loads of punditry on TV, analysing the Republic of Ireland games. You also did your coaching badges. I think it seemed that without international football, you threw yourself into different elements of football. Yeah, I think so. Um, just other opportunities came up and um, obviously it was 
just something different and, and a new challenge as well, but still staying, remaining within the game as well. But I do think it is is important. I think as you get older, like you do do learn to have um, a little bit more balance in life. And I think when you're happier, um, like that's what I found now, I'm happy playing with the international setup. And when you're a happy, happier athlete, you're, you perform as um, it, it ch- refle- re- really clearly reflects in your performance, like so. And I think the lads would probably agree with that as well. And um, and that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, it's just enjoying your sport and and performing it to the highest level you can. Uh, when you say you're looking at your friends going on leaving certain holidays and you're unable to do so because of sporting commitments, does that change as you get older? Do you look at I don't know family occasions or, or social occasions and feel that envy as well, or did that dissipate over time? Like, I don't think at the time when I didn't go on a six-year holiday, it was a big problem for me because okay. my focus was just on playing football and, and that's all I wanted to do. But I think when, as you get older, then you do start to miss out things. And I think we have, the, obviously, the professional players are in a different boat, but us as amateurs playing in Ireland, we're obviously trying to juggle work and playing at that high level and, and trying to be an elite athlete. So that's a massive, massive commitment. And um, previous to the last few years, like we were taking unpaid days, leave off work, and eventually does take its toll on you as well. And you're missing out on these family occasions, and then you kind of take a step back and and look and reflect, and you're kind of just thinking, what direction is my life going after football? Mm. Um, as well, and I think that's something that you don't really consider when you're younger. Um, what what am I going to do when after football, after all these commitments, taking all these days off? Like you need to try and buy a house, get a mortgage, and um, just just little things like that as well that. You're not. We're not lucky to be in the same boat that maybe um, our male counterparts are in England. That they're earning um, huge and massive amount of money. That that might set them up for after. But I think sometimes that they do fall over and um, come across them barriers as well, going over a young age without their education. And um, so yeah, it's just just a massive balancing act. I think. I can imagine, uh, Eric. When you listen to the other two speak, is it different from your perspective being an individual? Like, do you think you would have perhaps struggled less earlier in your career if you were playing a sport that was a team sport, for example, that you might have had people to talk to on the same side as you? Like, I presume, as in an individual sport, the, the mental fortitude required is much higher. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, most of my old classmates, I'd be fr- on friendly terms with them, but. I'm not in their group, if you know what I mean, but they're all GAA, uh, everyone, they're all GAA heads and um, they play for the local club. I played at school level, but I've done a lot of sports, but boxing was just one that I excelled at and I had a great coach and, you know, he kind of, uh, I wanted I wanted to box for him and, you know, he was a great influence on my life, mentor, kind of a, you know, just a really good, good, good guy and, and um so that's the route I went down, but like I, I, I used to be envy, I, envious of um, my all my former classmates because they were all, um, like I said, they were all part of the GA club and had this big kind of, and they still have a great support, a great unit, and they all like um, there's a great camaraderie and uh, with them all, and um, I even I, even to my own two sons, they're doing a bit of boxing at the moment, but they're doing other sports as well, and I wouldn't like them to do boxing to the level that I've that I'm at because it's a very lonely and tough game and um, the highs are high, the lows are very low, but I just think that the principles of boxing can be very good, can be very good to to, to help them get through life, through, through school, through college and help them in whatever route that they decide to go down. And, you know, if one of them turns around and has a dream to become a world professional boxing champion or a world Olympic champion, I, I'd have to support them. But, Ideally, I'd like them to go down more of the route of team sports because I just think it's more beneficial for them in a in a more kind of a holistic and well-being uh, type uh, or in a way. Uh, interesting to hear on you. They're talking about like you know the the difference between you know the the ladies' game and 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 the men's game. Like there's huge there's a huge disparity there, especially when it comes to finance and you know they're playing for their country and it's a great honor to play for your country and um, but she's also trying to think about the future as well and think about like real real life issues like you know mortgages and bills and housing like these these are the these are the things that athletes are faced with and especially um, like even though she's playing at a professional level it's still almost amateur when it comes to earning money and stuff and uh, you know endorsements or sponsorships or anything like that so they can give a huge chunk of their life and then suddenly 
you don't really get much even as a, in, in a way of kind of like a, a thanks or anything. It's kind of like next, then there's someone going to fill your place, there's someone going to fill your spot. I remember being so disheartened at the end of my amateur career because I had won so much and I have achieved so much representing Ireland. And and it was, it was just, there was no real kind of like, you know, big kind of a celebration of what I'd done or not that I was looking for that, but I just found that I was alone. You know, I was actually alone and there was no real uh, uh, kind of a comeback on everything. You know, there was no benefit to me for what I have given, given most of my life and uh, to a sport. And you just realize that, you're, you know, it's kind of sink or swim. And that's why I, that's why I went back into education and, I was faced with another four years from the London Olympics to the Rio Olympics. But over that four years, if I wanted to, if I wanted to pursue the Rio Olympic Games, I had to fund my own travel to Dublin. I had to stay in, like I had to um, pay for my own equipment. I had to pay for, uh, try and pay to keep, you know, uh, support for my, my two kids. It just wasn't feasible for me anymore. I was like, I can't do this. As much as I'd really love to go to the Olympic Games, I cannot do this. And I kind of had a eureka moment there in my life. It was kind of like I need to, I need to change. I have to change and do something. And 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 that change has done me the world of good because, you know, Ian and and Arnie would tell you, you can't be on the pitch and off the pitch at the same time. Mm. You can't be in the ring and outside the ring at the same time. And during my time from being outside the ring, I got to see boxing in a different way. I got to. <clears throat> I got to educate myself and learn about it and see it from a different perspective. So when you get back in to it, you've 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 just a new understanding, a new learning, things that you things that you were blind to before. And the happiness and the contentment, that's where the best athletes are. Where they're hap- when they're happy and they're content, they can express themselves without having the pressures of results or what's going to happen if I lose or if I fail. All of this all of this negative stuff has gone out of my life now. I'm just enjoying boxing and being free and expressing myself. And I find that my performances have just gone to a whole new level. I'm better now at almost 35 years of age than I ever was in my, in my amateur, at my peak in my amateur career, which would have been around 25, 26 mm. years of age. And that's a very interesting point, which I want to get into in a moment as well. But just on what you were saying there about your eureka moment, Eric, like how does one actually find that eureka moment? It's, it's probably such a, a nebulous idea to, to people on the outside looking in. But like, what, what was that eureka moment for you? How, how do people try and find that to actually affect that change in their life and in their sporting careers? It's hard to know. Like it's it's different for everybody because life experiences are different for everybody. You know what might have an effect on me might not have an effect on somebody else. Sure. But I just kind of I just kind of felt at that time that I was almost felt like a waster. You know, I felt like in my life that like okay, I've done all of this. I've massive geographical kind of a education, a cultural education. I was in Philippines. I was in China, Korea, Canada, America, all over Europe, representing my country get experience in different cultures and everything and loads of medals loads of medals world series of boxing gold medal a european bronze medal and you know five times irish elite champion but none of this is going to pay the bills and i kind of felt like what the hell you know what 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 does what does this all mean what does it stand for and i kind of in some ways i kind of felt that my boxing career was in vain then and uh, thankfully i i can see it as a different thing it's not now it's you know i look at it now as a very special time in my life and i also look at at what i've learned throughout and i didn't realize this at the time but i've learned so much about the area of health and fitness and uh you know strength and conditioning and nutrition and all that so i set up a i set up my own business uh, eric donovan's boxer size and fitness and i do a lot of uh, similar to what Anya does, personal training, and I do classes, and I go into schools, and I do, I do community and fit, community boot camps and that type of stuff. And I work with a lot of sports teams as well. And I've been very lucky to work with some senior and intermediate GA teams, and uh, had a lot of success along the way as well. So, in a way, it isn't it like it's not. It's I don't look back in vain. I look at it now as an asset. It's an asset to me. But for for different people, there are different. There, there, there will be different times in their life where they have where the penny drops for them. It's different for everybody, Owen. Mm. 
do you feel that that penny dropping then will elongate your career? Like obviously you've, you've you've mentioned your age and how you're still going strong. Like if anything, on a purely practical level, taking a bit of time out to assess things would allow the body to go a bit longer as well. Without a doubt, without a doubt, yeah. But like again, it goes back to what you do in your lifestyle. Mm. I honestly believe that mo in a lot of in a lot of athletes' lives, it's what you do outside of the ring, what you do outside of the gym. That will determine what you achieve inside the inside the ring, inside the gym. You know what I mean? It's um, I couldn't really put this together growing up. I was kind of like, I, you know, when you're a young kid, you think you know it all, you know everything, you know. And uh, even the the wisdom that I that well, I suppose people would have been trying to offer me words of wisdom throughout my career, but I would have just let it into one ear and out to the other and never really listened. I always felt like I had it under control, but I hadn't, I hadn't got it under control. But when you watch a young kid now that's doing the ordinary things, the ordinary things like staying, not going out for parties, not, you know, eating healthy, getting a good night's sleep, being punctual, being disciplined, being a nice kind person, being helpful, being supportive, and then has talent. You look at a kid like that and you know that they're going to go very far in life because all they have to do is just be consistent with that. They don't have to be in a way kind of extraordinary or special in a kind of a unique type of way. Like, you know, don't have to have this ungodly talent. They just have to have a, a good bit of talent and then marry that with hard work and commitment and just be a good human being. And then you will start, you will get your just rewards. I genuinely believe that. Where I had an abundance of talent, but I wasn't marrying up that talent with hard work. And I was cutting corners and cutting shortcuts and everything throughout my life. And uh, massive learning, massive learning experiences. But you're, I'm just delighted to be able to kind of say that I've come through all of that. And I'm still here today competing at the very top level because I don't want to be another statistic. I know so many people from, from so many towns um, who, and I hear so many people say, oh, he was a great boxer, or he was a great footballer, or he was a great uh, uh, rugby player, or she was brilliant at this, you know, and, and the drink got the better of them, or, or the, the drugs, or whatever, like, you know, they lost their way to whatever reason, but you never really hear m many stories about the person that turned it around, you know, your dreams are still alive, you can get back in the driving seat and actually turn it around, you know, get your life, grab the bull by the horn and turn it around and be successful. You know, it doesn't have to always be a sad story behind all of this. It can be a, a, an inspiring story, one of um, reinvention and one of uh, redemption. And, and then that's the story that you need to tell people. It's pretty good advice. Uh, only I'd be keen to get your take on a lot of what uh, Eric said there. We might just start with the idea of self-worth. And he mentioned women's football in Ireland, obviously, very obvious cases of women's sport all around the world, especially with football in Ireland, about your worth not being respected by people at the top of the hierarchy. Did that affect how you felt on the pitch and your entire self-worth as a footballer? Um, I don't think it would have affected how we felt on the pitch. I think right. we always would have had really good togetherness as as a team as well. And I, I do think this is something that's changing now, um, like with women's football, with RT showing the the women's world cup and it is it is growing um, a little bit more of a fan base and and a little bit more of an interest now it still has a long way to go but um i do think it is on the up and um which is great to see a, com a lot of big comparisons from when i started playing and the opportunities now for the girls to to be in a better environment and and um, the resources that are available to them is great and hopefully in a few years that the women's international team will benefit from that but there's still a lot of work to go and and um, the women's national league here, which is um, the the equivalent to the League of Ireland, um, as well. So, but look, I think everything's moving in the right direction. It does come down to like resources and finances, and if you don't invest in something, how do you expect it to get out um, results at the end? But um, obviously, things are great in the women's international team at the moment. Um, we we the resources are great, and if we I think if we qualify for the European Championships, that would be every big turning point in um, for women's football. For sure. Would you go along with what Eric said, that it's half to do with the really simple things if you're trying to turn a sporting career around? Eric mentioned, as a young person, just not going to parties and being consistent with that. Is that something you would agree with? 
yeah, hundred percent. It's attitude. Like it all comes mm. down to, to to your attitude at the end of the day, and how much you're willing to sacrifice to to succeed in your sport. But and you need good guidance as well, and and um, good structures and a, a really good environment to to flourish and, and maximize potential. Like Eric as well. I've seen so many talented players that I would have played with growing up, and and um, they're not even playing football now at the moment. And it's a massive shame. It's shame if they had been. Given the support when they were they were younger and um, right throughout the setup, um, they they probably would have been playing for Ireland today too. Ian, I'd be keen to to get your take then on the the longevity of the career in terms of actually taking a break as you did. Like many high profile rugby players have done it, Ian Asela, Dan Carter, Richie McCaw all took sabbaticals from a very attritional sport to elongate their career. That probably wasn't the reason why you did it, but is that a positive, unintended consequence of your hiatus from the sport? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I was really two years that I that I wasn't really playing, so hopefully that's one or two years I can get mm. uh, back at the end. Um, so I, I think it's it's something maybe that that you might see more and more. Maybe not for two years, but I think definitely kind of four or five month injury, uh, four or five month break can do the world of good. You know. Um, Guys get to play get a kind of one month off season, but there's some niggles and, and little things that you, they're never enough that you would would stop training or stop playing. But but they probably need a few months to, to recover and um, maybe at, at the halfway point of, of people's rugby careers, if they were to get that six month sabbatical, then I think that would um, would definitely kind of add another year or two towards the end. Do, do you think that? Is something that perhaps the IRFU should look into, especially with some of their centrally contracted players. Like there, there was a lot of talk uh, around the Australia tour in 2018 about whether or not Johnny Sexton should even travel just to give him that summer off and allow him to kind of rest the body for a little while and perhaps elongate that time off just so that he's fresh and ready for the Rugby World Cup in 2019. Yeah, maybe. I think. You know, it's probably be, it'd probably be difficult to do it as a kind of rule of thumb, but I think mm. for individual players, it's definitely something that that you know might be might be made available to them. I think, in fairness to the RFU, I think they're they're very good for managing players um, and players' game time and mm. the amount of minutes they play. And um, my experiences with the Irish provinces are that it's incredibly science-based, you know, and uh, and players are in general really well looked after. So. Um, that's probably why a lot of Irish guys stay in Ireland because they know that, you know, versus going to France, you 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 probably get an extra year or two if you if you stay in Ireland. Uh, um, but I think definitely for certain guys, like you know, I don't want to name names, but for certain guys who you know playing uh, high level rugby for for years, and some guys who now you know are are, are being are regular starters for Ireland in the early twenties, those guys kind of five six years down, if they could probably get a break for a few months. I think that would do them the world of good and then and then they'd get that time again at the end of their careers. Yeah, potentially giving someone like James Ryan a summer off. Don't, don't kind of uh, impose every single summer on him for the next few years, perhaps before the next World Cup. Biden be the worst shout in the world. Just kind of a, on a final point then, Ian, like this has been a time of reflection for a lot of people during this pandemic. Uh, it's been an enforced hiatus, as we've already mentioned. Is it something you'd recommend your entire situation, the way you've progressed in sport, to take some time out, to reflect, to go to college, to pursue something else, uh, and ultimately elongate your career? Is it, is it something you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd hate, I'd hate for it to come across in any way. This. That I didn't enjoy playing rugby. That's not the case at all. I do it. I do it all over again. Um, but having said that, I think you need to look at a, a career in professional sport with open eyes. And it's there's highs and there's lows, like Eric was saying, you know. And, and um, it's important to get perspective. And I think sometimes when you go head first, as you do when you're 15, 16, and you kind of go into the professional, start going into the professional rugby environment. And to some extent, you have to. You just have to go first, a hundred percent. But it's good maybe to have someone who can give you a bit of perspective at times, mm -hmm. um, whether that's your parents or, or some mentor in your life who can maybe give you a bit of balance. And, and, and you know, I think that's um, yeah. I, I suppose on reflection, um, I think you know it's it's a great career, hundred percent. But I think that there's you have to remember that it's not going to be there forever and um, you need to have, have, have that perspective I think is, is a big help that maybe I learned a little bit too late. 
Eric, is that something you go along with? And do you think that what's happened over the last few months will actually inspire a few more people to perhaps not invest as much time in their elite sports levels to actually go and sample something else? Yeah, it's a tricky one, though, mm. because, like, you know, the window of, uh, of chance or the window of opportunity when it comes to elite-level sport or professional sports is very slim and small. You kind of have to sometimes just just go for it. But I, 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 I think the most important thing in life is to have a support team around you. Uh, Ian mentioned that there, Anya referred to it, in the environment, you know, where you can flourish, where you can blossom, where you can bloom. So if it doesn't work out that you actually have the good support unit around you, so then you go on to plan B, you know, and that you don't fall through the cracks. How many professional footballers went over to England, gave up on education, spent six or seven years on the sidelines or trying to break into teams and then come back you know 24 25 years of age yeah and 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 suddenly they they don't they, they feel like losers and they feel like wasters and stuff like that you know what i mean that yeah. that can happen so it's important to have good people guiding you and and to tr i think you need to have the hunger as well as it, like you need to have the hunger inside you to want to st always strive to be better not only as an athlete, but as a human being, as a person, you know, and there's many yeah. ways, you, there's many ways you can do that. Absolutely. Uh, listen, it's been great chatting to all three of you. We could go on for another hour here, but we'll have to leave it there. It's Ony O'Gorman, Eric Donovan and Ian Nagel. That's who you've been listening to for the last hour. Thanks a million for your time, folks. Thank you. Uh, that Thank is you. it for this week's Saturday panel. If you're just joining us, you'll be able to listen back to the full piece soon on the OTB Podcast Network. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Team news from the Premier League games next. Off the ball on News Talk. As the new government commits to abolishing direct provision, News Talk examines the much debated system. I never really thought this would hit me so hard. I had to pack my life into two suitcases. Living in a room 